Hi, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kaustub Fanse. Uh, I've been with Airtight for six plus years, uh, and you know, joined Airtight as the principal wireless architect, and uh, now serve as the chief evangelist uh, for the Airtight technology. Uh, so, as David mentioned, you know, uh, there's a lot of background to Airtight in the wireless security space, uh, but we are going to focus today on you know a lot of the exciting developments that have happened at Airtight. Uh, in the last you know, 18 to 24 months, uh, focusing particularly on cloud-managed Wi-Fi access. <clears throat> so before I jump into a live product demo, I uh, also want to you know, extend on you know, what David mentioned, uh, in, in just setting a little more context, uh, because you know, in 2010, uh, when we started uh, you know, engaging with our customers who were you know, actually asking Airtight to actually you know, Build Wi-Fi access as a part of the solution, and you know at that time there were already you know, a lot of very good wireless LAN products out there in the market, and so we asked the question, why airtight, right? Uh, we asked the question ourselves. We asked the question to our customers, and as we started discussing it with our customers, there were a lot of common themes uh, that we started in, you know emerging from our discussions. An overarching theme really was that a lot of large enterprise customers across you know, different verticals, whether it's you know, retail, hospitality, education, and so on, were looking to deploy and roll out Wi-Fi across a distributed footprint, a large distributed footprint of the scale of you know, hundreds, thousands, or in some cases, tens of thousands of locations across a country, a continent, or even globally. Right? So when, it, when you start thinking about rolling out Wi-Fi and being able to manage it easily, centrally, across all those locations, it's a very different problem than you know, having Wi-Fi, you know, hundreds of APs that are deployed in a single campus. Right? So one of the themes that emerged is the customer said, we need a Wi-Fi solution, which is deployed across these hundreds or thousands of locations, that we can very, very easily manage centrally without having to train our IT in you know, specific products. So when we looked around, we actually found that you know, while there are a lot of great products, they are really tailored to a very, very skilled IT staff. And a lot of the customers that we started talking to were you know, looking to deploy Wi-Fi at these remote sites with potentially no IT staff. And it was mostly you know, very scarce uh, IT staff that was sitting at the headquarters managing the whole deployment. So can we have a easy to manage Wi-Fi net uh, solution that does not require extensive training, product certifications, and so on, right? The second related, uh, I think, trend that emerged was when you think about rolling out Wi-Fi across these you know, hundreds or thousands of locations, it's very, again, different from a campus deployment where you have you know, an IT staff, you can stage the whole rollout, while in a distributed environment, you are essentially looking to you know, drop ship APs directly to those remote sites where you may not have IT staff, right? So how do you make it very, very easy for them to just plug the access points in, bring the uh, Wi-Fi network up and running without having to go through in you know, a lot of local configuration, right? And the third uh, theme that also emerged was obviously the scale, right? Uh, so the customers asked, you know, can we have a Wi-Fi network which can scale linearly as we start plugging, going from you know, the 100th location to the 1,000th location, or the 1,000th location to the 10,000th location, without having to worry about <coughs> adding more boxes, whether it's you know, uh, uh, actually a hardware, or a virtual server, or a manager at various locations, or buying more software licenses, or having to you know, pay for more administration seats on the management console. Right? So there are obviously not just the manageability or ease of use, but also a cost involved. And finally, uh, the fourth theme uh, that actually emerged was a lot of the customers wanted flexibility or choice, right? Because some customers wanted to go for uh, a subscription-based model where they did not have a CapEx budget. So they wanted a choice even the way they actually invest in their Wi-Fi rollout. The other option was actually also the way you deploy or manage uh, in terms of if you wanted to do it on site using an appliance or even in your own data center using a virtual infrastructure or in a public cloud right so you know we 
looked at all these things and you know looked around we looked at you know all the you know great products that are already out there but we despite that we saw definitely that you know the customers were obviously not wrong they, there was some amazing opportunities there uh, in the kind of questions that they had brought up so we looked at each other and said you know why not just go ahead and build a wifi access solution that actually directly addresses ground up from scratch those challenges that a lot of these customers are facing especially when you are looking at you know large geographical distributed footprint so with that context i am now directly going to jump into a product demo uh, to show you uh, you know some of the things uh, that really highlight uh, the airtight uh, wifi product <clears throat> So to begin with what I've done here is I've actually logged into one of our cloud airtight cloud servers. Uh, so as you can see I'm you know logged in through the Chrome browser and this cloud server is actually you can see that you actually have you know several live Wi-Fi networks that are actually hosted on this particular cloud server, right? And these are in fact live Wi-Fi networks that are hosted either for demos or a lot of customers uh, who want to do proof of concepts essentially prospective customers who want to test out their airtight product so these are all you know live airtight wifi networks that are currently being tested or demoed right now i want to to begin with bring your attention to the left hand side panel that you see here which what we call as the hierarchical location tree which i believe is very unique to the way we have architected this solution right so the way i look at this is this view if you will is almost like a managed service provider view so if i am a managed service provider with hundreds or thousands of customers that i want to manage centrally from a single html5 console i get to see them all of them here right now i am also going to quickly dive into a particular account right uh, a for demo purposes i have created a customer account called gba holding so i'm quickly going to you know search for uh oops is this flash based or will it work html no no this is html5 so as you can see as i quickly search for a particular customer the the whole location tree that had earlier you know thousands of customers has quickly pruned down to a particular location now one of the key requirements of a true cloud solution especially when you are actually having multiple customers sitting on a single server instance is multi tenancy right so from a managed service provider view i get the entire view but from an individual customer point of view i want to see how my experience is right so what i've done is on another browser i'm logging into the same server using an account that i've created for the customer called gba holding okay So I'm moving to Firefox, and as you can see, so this was a, what I may call as a super user account previously, right? While what I'm switching to is a customer account uh, created by Sean, one of our systems engineers, right? <coughs> so as you can see here, as a as a customer on the same cloud server, I'm now able to obviously you know look at only my part of the location tree. now what all i can i do with this location tree because i, I want to spend some time uh, discussing this because <clears throat> i see this as really being a foundation or a building block to everything that it enables in terms of you know all the challenges that we talked about in the beginning it's really uh, this is really the foundation so one of the first things that you will notice is that enterprises can now map their geographically distributed deployment in a very uh, you know easy to navigate form right so you can create any level of hierarchy right so i'm going to you know navigate through one of these locations right let's say north america in this case so i have branch offices main offices then i have bunch of stores under a particular store if this is a you know retail customer I, if i have multiple brands that i own i have i can you know have them logically grouped as brands so as you can see this really provides you a way to more or less you know however you want to actually you know manage your information 
and manage your policies and manage everything that you do on the right hand side which I'll you know quickly dive into yes question so I know that you guys don't have your own switch line um, at the same time is there any provision you know the the whole single pane of glass goal that everybody seems to have is there any provision whatsoever for SNMP ma or monitoring of switches or simple monitoring of any switches whatsoever in the framework correct so as far as uh, the actual i mean i will get to get to a point where you know i will actually show you how you can you know talk about specific devices whether it is you know in this case access points right now yep. but you know in the future if you we go down the path let's say you know of a branch router or a switch then there is we have the way we have architected it is that it is extensible to accommodate that so but i'll get to that definitely okay thank yeah. you I do have a question as well, sure. actually. Um, so with the multi-tenancy and the way you've got it set up here, um, yeah. could theoretically you also use that to create an admin that, say, could only look at North America or uh, have a company who's running a managed service have multiple different businesses managing different parts of the interface? Great question. That's that was the exact next thing that I was go going to get to. So we talked about multi-tenancy at a customer level, right? So when we talked about managed service, you had multiple customers, and then obviously, you know, when you log in as a super user for a customer, you get to see your data. Now, within a particular customer, which actually we have today, you know, we have a lot of live customers that have things like, you know, you have corporate-owned locations or and franchisee-owned locations, or you have, as I've shown you, or you have multiple brands, right? Uh, or in some cases, you may want to actually group them by geography, like North America versus APAC. So this architecture, absolutely, you know, that's the whole idea. I mean, it lends itself to, you know, taking that multi-tenancy concept all the way from the individual customer level into a particular customer account. So you can create policies, you can create role-based administration for any particular location or group of locations in this case, yes. And I'll, get, I'll even get to that uh, when we get to the configuration. Can you do any branding, customized branding, so that if you are running a MSP play, yes. you can change up. So the in fact, we do have managed service providers. So I mean, being HTML5, it makes it very easy for us to you know quickly you know white label and provide it, uh, yeah, with custom branding. Yes. So uh, moving on from your know, location tree, and we'll keep coming back because you know every time I you know do something on the right hand side, whether it's you know the dashboard. I'll move on to the devices or show you the configuration. I'll keep referring to the location tree because as I said, it's really the fundamental building block of you know, the way we organize the information. Now, when it comes to the dashboard, uh, what we have done is you know, using HTML5, it gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of you know, making it user customizable, right? So what we have done is depending on who logs in, you get an opportunity to see your own dashboard. You can create your own new dashboards. So I can, for instance, simply click on an add dashboard uh, icon. I can define that I want for my dashboard, right? And if I click, I have a whole new dashboard now. And now I can actually look at a palette of 25 plus widgets that allow me to you know, quickly configure the dashboard that I want to see. Right? So these widgets we have organized in terms of the network level. So if I want certain statistics at the network level, which is you know, at either at, since we are talking about locations, I want to see my locations, uh, location-based statistics. Uh, if I want to see certain trends at the SSID level, right? Uh, or if I want to go one level down and I want to actually see it at the access point level or actually see at the client level, right? And all I need to do is to click on a particular widget and you know just like that i have a whole uh, new dashboard uh, created right so in this case let's say i choose locations by association right now for a particular uh, a widget uh, if i look at let's say uh, in this case in fact drill down to <clears throat> The mountain view folder, right, which is where we actually have all, all, all the data. <clears throat> now, in addition to the widgets that you see here, you can also have a location map uh, that you can drill down to. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. So if I go to locations, I can actually define 
uh, a map uh, for each of my floor levels. Let me see. Just, uh... <clears throat> so, uh, in a particular widget, when I look at, uh, let's say, this particular widget, I can actually drill down for a particular location based on SSIDs, right? Now, or in, in terms of time, right? And it's depending on the widget, uh, you have you know, dif different, different times uh, modules where you can actually you know, drill down further into uh, a particular time zone, whether it's you know, one month or two month period. I can zoom in, right? Or from an SSID perspective, uh, if I actually, let's see if I can, for illustrations, uh, let me find out actually. Are those SSIDs sorted by however many clients are associated? Is there any rhyme or reason? Uh, the number of the, the SSIDs that actually show up? At the way they're sorted? Correct. So, right, right, right. So those will typically uh, be based on, you know, the location I am. So it will start, go with the hierarchy. So it will go with, you know, whatever SSIDs are local and then go further down. Now, if I move on uh, to the devices tab. So going beyond the dashboard, again, when you come to the devices tab, you again are in the context of a particular location, right? So if I select, let's say currently I'm at the corporate level, if I select, you know, at the mountain view level, then it's going to, you know, give me the devices at that particular uh, location. And in this case, I'm really talking about the entire devices on this particular tab, right? Now, at the mountain view level, if I, go to, so okay, uh, a particular device, I get a chance to actually select. So in this case, you will see that the WFD, uh, uh, you know, five access points that we are actually, you know, running out here uh, are, you know, live and I can actually, you know, quickly see uh, their properties. You know, it's a dual radio device, you know, it's running in a certain mode. Uh, and similarly, this particular device in the, running in a particular mode. Now, when I select a particular device, I actually can, again, have what we call as mini dashboards right at the bottom, so that without having to drill down multiple levels into the UI, I can simply click on a particular widget and get a lot of information about in term, you know, the, the AP performance, the number of clients that are associated, uh, and so on. And if the APs are also actually monitoring beyond the channel that they're actually serving Wi-Fi access on, then as you will see, you will obviously also see, get a, a lot of information about you know, what is in your wireless airspace. So, How often is that updated? So this is typically, uh, I think by default, uh, it is updated every five minutes. <coughs> is, that, is that customizable? Sorry? Is it customizable how? Yeah, yeah, there is a setting. In, so the, the, a lot of these thresholds are customizable, yes. So if you were looking for like a live view of something, is there another user interface into the AP that you can go look at? Or is, is, your, is, your, is the NMS UI the only visibility into the infrastructure? So, OK, so <laughs> recently we, in fact, also launched a local UI. Uh -huh. uh, if you want to log directly into the AP, uh, typically, what we have tried to do is, at least from a remote monitoring perspective, we have made sure that we capture all the important information right here in this UI. But there is an option to also, uh, you know, log into the AP as well. Yes. <clears throat> now, in addition to the airtight devices that you are seeing. As, as I said, you know, if you, if you have an, a particular device that is not only providing Wi-Fi access, but you know, doing wireless monitoring from a security perspective, it is going to give you complete visibility into what is in your airspace, right? And you know, as David mentioned, you know, the 
focus of today's presentation is not on Airtight's WIPS capability, but one of the things that you know you see here is actually the color coding, which is one of, has been one of the key differentiators for Airtight for, as a, from a wireless security perspective. Uh, you know, using certain patented techniques, we are able to automatically classify all devices, you know, Wi-Fi devices that get detected as being authorized. That is, you know, we, the, the ones that you have actually deployed are on your network versus external shown in blue that are just, you know, legitimate neighborhood devices versus rogue devices, if any, that are actually on your wired network without permission, right? So unauthorized devices that are on your wire without permission. And this is done without having to define any signatures. And how do you track down rogues that are actually on the network? How do you trace it on the wire side? Right, so uh, I think, you know, we have a patented technique, what we call as a marker packet technique, right? So rather than relying on just, you know, uh, Mac correlation or, you know, polling switches or, you know, cam table lookups, uh, which do not give you full visibility and also are very time consuming, uh, we have a technique where, you know, an airtight device, whether it's an AP or a sensor, will inject a small broadcast packet, what we call as a marker packet, which is very similar to an R packet. Now, it will have certain information in that packet, which will allow that device to also recognize that packet if it again sees it come out. So the way to think about it is one technique where we actually inject the packet on the wire, and if that packet bleeds out in the air, that packet has all the information of which MAC address, you know, the wi wired and wireless AP that is on the wire has actually spit it out. Now, not all APs will spit out broadcast traffic onto the air. So we have other techniques that we combine where certain techniques we also inject a packet all over the air addressed to a device on the wire and similarly have a feedback loop to definitively track whether a device is on your wire or not. Now, as using the automatic AP classification as the basis, then you also get into being able to automatically classify client devices based on behavior, right? So a lot of this information is very much based on behavior. Airtight takes a very different approach of you know, not going down the path of you know, having the administrator define tons of signatures, because that only leads to a lot of false positives and negatives. So here, based on the device behavior, they will also get classified Again, as you know, authorized, rogue, or external. And within a particular device, again, as you see, if it's a smart device, you will be able to fingerprint that particular device, right? Uh, and you know, if you want to drill down, uh, in this case, you can always, you know, on either you can quickly apply a filter right here for a particular device name or MAC address, or I can, you know, quickly go in and search for, let's say, all the iPads uh, that I want to look at, right? So this allows us to you know, you know, have information, but also be able to quickly drill down into specific device information that you want to get to. And how are you profiling your client devices? Is that DHCP fingerprinting or? You mean the fingerprinting? Yeah. Yes, so it's a combination of you know, uh, multiple packets that they send out, you know, MDNS, DHCP, mm -hmm. yes. And for the behavior, mm -hmm. What exactly do you mean when you're saying you're, like you're, I'm assuming you mean authorized guests, so on and so forth. Correct. Like, what behavior would make an iPhone authorized, other than the fact it connected to an authorized AP, which Correct. doesn't necessarily mean it's authorized. Right. So typically, as uh, you know, we'll look into the configuration. When it comes to wireless security or WIPs policies, you will have you know the basic template. Rather than defining signatures about how a rogue, AP, rogue AP might look like, you basically just define your template about how your authorized wireless LAN setup looks like, because that is that you know exactly how it looks like, right? In terms of authentication, encryption, vendor, and whatnot, right? So there are a bunch of uh, options to do that. Once you have that template in place, the behavior that we are talking about is whether a client is connecting to an authorized AP and is able to successfully authenticate with that AP. Right, uh, or if a client connects to a rogue AP, then you can have a policy which says you know automatically classify those clients as rogue. Okay. And once you do that, based on behavior, you can actually then start you know defining actual intrusion prevention policies without worrying about you know interfering with neighboring networks. Very precisely, very surgically, can break connections that violate that, that those policies. 
so uh, and you know similarly you know similar to the devices we can also you know look at the networks or vlans you know that where the devices uh, are uh, uh, deployed for again a particular location so you will see that it, everything that i look at is in the context of a particular location that i have chosen right now let me quickly move on uh, to the configuration uh, where you know you had you know some of the questions in terms of you know being able to manage different types of devices you know different types of aps going forward for potentially you know switches and routers so the device what we call as a device template is where it all comes together for airtight customers right now you'll notice that this particular tile says customize so that is another interesting feature of the location tree the way the location tree behaves is that it allows an administration to define a device template that we will look at in a minute and apply it to a particular location once a device template is applied to a particular location all child locations if you will under that parent node will inherit those policies okay so you may have 10 aps below that folder you may have 10000 aps below that folder all will inherit those policies in one shot right selectively override yes so that's the next question right so which is exactly what you see here so the next question is if i want to selectively customize and break the inheritance i can do that and i can do that at a device level i can do that at a network level or i can do that at a group of locations right based on the local administrator wanting to run a different ssid over and above some base policy so you can define certain base policies that you cannot fiddle with and you know from the super user that you inherit and then you can actually modify and customize the template so if you go into the template so you already see you know there are a lot of the templates that are available that have been defined somewhere up the location tree right uh, and it also allow, you know tells you at which location a particular template was created in this location tree correct so there are some that are at the top server level there are some at the corporate level some at the mountain view level so to give you an example you know we are running the wfd5 guest network here right so let me actually quickly open the device template that is actually running on the access points that you are connect all connecting to now in a template you have you know certain device settings in terms of you know the device password the logs uh you know the vlan settings you know in terms of which vlan you want that device to actually be plugged to uh you al also have detailed settings for from a wireless monitoring perspective in terms of which channels you want to monitor if you want to customize those but what i'll focus on today is actually the radio settings from both wifi access perspective and wireless security right so from a radio setting perspective you will notice that it allows me to select multiple models right the models that i have already selected are already defined here so those are grayed out but if when i start you know from scratch i will have all the models that i can select now going back to i think lee's question this is a very extensible the way it is architected so tomorrow if you want to actually define a switch in this architecture it is very easy to actually add a switch model or a branch router model or additional access point models so in in the same template so what you now have is one template that you are applying to a location folder you know passing it on to all the locations below it and you can potentially define any permutation combination of these devices whether it's aps in the future it could be wired switches and define your configuration for all those models now once we apply a template maybe not all locations have all those models right so you have you might have a mixed deployment some may have you know a particular ap others may actually have multiple ap models deployed the ap model that you have deployed picks up the configuration that is relevant to that ap model right so you don't have to worry about managing different types of aps in a single deployment uh through you know multiple configuration settings so if if i go into a particular device now if i click on let's say the c60 model which is a dual radio software configurable 
device, right? So that has been, again, one of the things that particularly with this access point that Airtight has done is that rather than sourcing off the shelf, you know, dual radio three by three access points, when we talked to a lot of our customers, they said, it's great to have the ability to run two APs in a single box, but if I don't want to compromise on my wireless security to switch, you know, by switching to just background scanning, nor do I want to actually put extra hardware for my wireless sensors. This particular device has software-defined band unlocked radios. So you have complete flexibility into, first of all, being able to choose the operation mode, whether you want to run it as an access point or a VIP sensor, right? on both the radios individually, so I can turn one of them into a VIP sensor if I want. So currently we are looking at the WFD5 template, so you see that the C60 device that is sitting right there is actually running both radios as an access point. Now once I do that, I have the ability to actually select the band of operation, right? So if I go for the second radio as a dedicated VIP sensor, I can define the frequency band is either 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz, right? So I am not locked to a particular band. And that is the same uh, for the other radio as well, right? I have a question. If you've got such a, a small AP and you turn both radios into 5 gigahertz mode, won't you get some um, interference from the two, two radios being so close to each other? Correct. So there are when it comes to while the device is capable of you know having all those different you know settings the way the device template is architected right now is we have made it if if you will uh, dump proof so we the way we allow customers to use it is while yes it is completely <coughs> software configurable but by default if i try to run both on 5 gigahertz it won't allow me to define it okay Right. Or worse, both on 2.4 gigahertz. Or 2.4, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Is so, the, uh, so you can't have two 5 gig radios? No, not two 5 gigahertz radios, no. However, if you are running one as an AP, either 2.4 or 5, the other radio, if you define it as a VIP sensor, is a dedicated dual band VIP sensor. So it will scan both the bands. Now, as an access point, obviously, as you can see, you have you know all these standard radio configurations in terms of you know, channel width, uh, operating channel. And when it comes to defining your mapping your SSIDs, you actually just add your SSIDs, right? And I'll now, after we are done with the template, I'll also show you how you can define an SSID profile. Now, once you define an SSID profile, you will have all these SSID profiles that are available at that location that can be simply added to a particular device, right? From that dialog box you just had open, is there? Sure. I didn't see one, um, no option to create a profile. Right so there. that's a separate, so you create a profile, so I'll get to that. So you don't create a profile from inside the template, but it's a different, uh, so if I get I'm just, exit. I'm just thinking from a usability standpoint, it would be nice to not have to pop out of that if I realize sure. I have a profile so, and just hit I mean, create good point. Uh, I mean, the way typically the, uh, the workflow is that you typically go get into Wi-Fi access and define the SSID profiles first. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean that is something you know if you if you know you don't see what you want, then you should be able to do it right inside the template as well. Can you apply those templates to an AP group? Is, yes. So instead of having all the C60s act one way, I could correct split them up. Yeah, yeah. So you can have different templates with different settings for let's say C60, and as long as you can organize those APs in terms of the location folders, in terms of groups. So you might ha have on floor one odd numbers and floor twos, so. Right, so if you want to actually, in a given location, bifurcate, you know, have two separate, then you can actually do it. If you go back to the devices, I can select specific devices on that floor or at that location and then change the device settings, uh, device template that they have, yes. Can you go back to the last screen you had up a minute ago? The, can, the, the device template? template? Yeah. So let me open the same one. You said you made it, uh, I don't know, forget the term you used, dumb proof. Mm -hmm. You couldn't do something wrong. Do you have it so you cannot go to a 2040 and 24? <laughs> no. Yes, that is correct. So if I do 2040 and try to save it, uh, where is the 2.4? It will actually not allow me to do it. 
<laughs> Stop those dumb people. Sure. <laughs> So that is the device template. So I hope you, you can appreciate the ability to really empower all your settings in a device template and then be able to map that device setting to a particular location, <coughs> group of devices, or a specific device, and be able to quickly configure that. And the next step is obviously, you know, when you actually plug that device, what is the process? We'll get to that you know, in a few minutes in the next session. But quickly, you know, before that, I want to make sure that we look at some of the features that are available as a part of the SSID profile. Okay. So, or I can actually open an existing one. Again, let's open the WFD5 SSID profile, right? So this is again the actual SSIDs that we have running here, right? The WFD guest. So you see, this is the one that is actually running here, right? It is a guest network. It is open. Uh, <coughs> You have the option to run it as a bridge or a NAT, right? If you do it as a NAT, you have the option to you know define your DNS servers for you know con DNS-based content filtering. If you are you know subscribed to a service or use you know service like an open DNS. <coughs> Is this NAT inside the AP? Correct. Good point. So all the settings that you see here in the SSID profiles are at the edge, right? So all this intelligence, whatever you define, is going to sit at the AP at a per SSID level. Right, so you have the ability to define NATs, bridge, you know, GRE tunneling, firewall settings, QoS settings on a per SSID level in a single box. Is is that NAT on like a uh, virtual IP or is it you're not NATing behind every individual access point or how are you doing that? Uh, like when my traffic comes out, am I NATing behind the AP and behind or am I NATing behind a shared virtual IP that all the APs are? Yeah, yeah, it's a you basically map each SSID to a VLAN. Yeah. And so you can, the, the natting will be then applied to that VLAN. So right, but if four I, APs. Yeah, if you got four APs. Do they each share the same pool? Yes, yes, yes. Correct. How do they, how do they negotiate who's going to give out the next Correct. IP good, address? Yeah, yeah, good question. So there is actually, uh, and I think I will also have Hemant uh, talk yeah, to it. So, so when you apply the template to multiple APs, right? So all those ranges are going in those APs. And as you see at the top, they are mapped to same VLAN because of the template. So these APs are going to then communicate with each other and synchronize their DHCP leases. So what happens is when you hand off a client from one AP to another, it's not going to get IP conflict there. Even if it does not renew its IP address, like some smartphones do. So the DHCP leases get synchronized between APs, which are on the same VLAN there, uh, when the template gets applied. So, you know, AirTAT offers also a lot of, uh, you know, pretty extensive guest Wi-Fi networking capability, uh, all the way from, you know, a simple AP-hosted splash page that you can actually upload onto the AP, all the way to, you know, radius-based authentication, uh, as well as, you know, a, a demo that we'll see in the next session where you can actually define different workflows, like, you know, social Wi-Fi login, uh, or if you know you have your own portal that you want the AP to direct all your guest users to, you can do that. You also can define a lobby ambassador kind of a workflow using uh, you know the guest guest manager. Also, you will see that you know all the standard you know settings for a guest network are available here in terms of you know the walled garden setting, uh, you know timeouts uh, for you know login, blackout timeouts, and so on. <clears throat> And, and we'll have a, you know, a more detailed session on guest Wi-Fi uh, and you know, particularly social Wi-Fi in the next session. In terms of the firewall, again, this firewall is on a per SSID level on sitting on the AP. Right? And you can simply define uh, you know, new rules. You can define you know, the ranking. Uh, and if I change my mind, I can quickly you know, move the rules around, and I can define it based on you know the tcp udp or you know, other protocols based on the domain based on you know the direction and so on all the stand typical you know basic firewall functions so a lot of the uh, your competitors have come out with uh, firewall functionality in their aps that are um, based on one of the leading uh, firewall vendors in the next generation firewall market that does more in depth packet inspection mm -hmm. packet inspection that type of thing, is your firewall functionality also able to do that? Right, so today we are, as you will see, actually there we have some functionality, what we call as content analytics. 
uh, it is not at this point as advanced at like you know deep packet inspection as some of the you know advanced next gen firewalls mm -hmm. would do it. Uh, we do it today at the level of the domain, uh, but absolutely the next step in the roadmap by the end of the year is to come up with that advanced uh, deep packet inspection. Okay. Yeah. What uh, the settings under the captive portal? Yes. Um, I just wanted to see the settings. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Captive portals, do they share like with multiple APs? Or does each AP host its own web server? So you have, yeah, yeah. so you, each AP will actually have uh, a captive portal running on it. You, I mean, you can, you have that option. In the first option, you have each AP hosting a splash page. Uh, but you also have the option to, you know, have it outside the AP. So if it is hosted as a third party server, then each AP will redirect there. It's so like social media. But if you're serving the page locally from AP, like click through, each, there will be a web server on the AP. And the advantage of that is they are fully operational at the edge then, even without dependency on management server. Could you assign one, say you had a, a remote site with four APs, mm -hmm. could you dedicate one to the web server rather than each one hosting it mm -hmm. individually? Well, today if we don't. DHCP shared, I just wonder if you had Captive Portal shared. Not, not today. Each one oh. will serve locally and separately. Which cascades to a whole bunch of other architecture control plane questions, right? Where does authentication happen? Um, can you do any sort of centralized data plane? You know, that, you know, well, how does it all work? It's right? all locally switch data plane. Okay. No, no option to do centralized data plane? Uh, like tunneling? No. Yeah, not no tunneling? No, okay. no tunneling. All right. Um, and then <clears throat> no, like uh, from an authentication perspective, every single AP is a radius authenticator? Uh, well, we use the enterprise, depend on enterprise radius, uh, Active Directory for 1x authentication. So AP is acting as an authenticator. Okay. rather than an authentication server in most of our deployments. And then from a roaming perspective, are you sharing those credentials among yes, the Yes, so when you move from, if a guest is authenticated on one AP, for example, mm -hmm. through a portal or social media, mm -hmm. when the guest moves to the next AP, the authentication state will be transferred. So and how does that happen? Is uh, so that happens on the VLAN where they're mapped to on the back end. It happens with the wire. Uh, so all these SSIDs are mapped to a VLAN through that template on a back end. So they share that communication channel. And it happens so that wire. If, if I've got a building with 100 APs and one person authenticates, that authentication session goes out to all 100 APs. But the state that he's is authenticated would go in, it will trickle, but uh, yes, it would, it would, today it would go to all of them. We don't control it on an air neighborhood basis today. Hmm. Are you saying that all the APs need to be on the same VLAN? Well, they need to be mapped to the same VLAN on the back end. So if they're operating as NAT to exchange this information, mm -hmm. the information is exchanged on the same VLAN. Right. One-to-one mapping. Yeah, it's one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, what about um, spanning networks? Well, if you can, single networks across distributed sites. No, no centralized data plane. I uh, was just wondering if there's any other trick, site-to-site -site VPN that gets built between APs and any kind of tunneling abilities to... Yeah, there is a yeah. GRE tunneling, for example. Hot so VPN, a huge yeah. case would be the guest traffic needs to be tunneled to a separate pop at the data center compared to where corporate traffic is going, right? So you have put all these NATs, but you still want all guest traffic to go to a certain pop. Then you send it to the GRE tunnel, that option there below the NAT, and terminate it on a Cisco router in a data center where it needs to go out. So that, that facility is available. What router do you terminate it on? Well, today Cisco, but so the, the idea is you don't even need, <laughs> the, you don't even need controller to terminate GRE sessions. That's the, that's the yeah. key point. So any router capable of terminating GRE? Yeah, standard GRE, yes, MGRE tunnels. So no AP to AP GRE tunnels? No, no AP to AP, no controllers required. Okay. They all tunnel directly onto the router where they go out. So uh, to quickly <coughs> wrap up this session, I want to make sure I stay on track for the next one. So the SSID profile also will allow you, uh, you know, a lot of the traffic shaping and quality of service uh, for you know handling data. Again, all of this intelligence will sit per SSID level at the AP, right? Uh, and similarly, you have the ability to do you know BYOD onboarding, where if you have, in this case, let's say a portal from where you want you know, all new devices to come in, 
be redirected to that portal, you know, take certain actions, whether it could be, you know, just entering some information, downloading an agent, uh, you can actually, you know, do that right at the AP. <clears throat> so with that, uh, I want to, you know, quickly also uh, go into the locations folder and uh, if you look at, for instance, at a floor level, right, uh, then you have you know all the standard cap capabilities of you know being able to visualize you know the heat map from a wireless security coverage perspective in this it is you know the Wi-Fi access point coverage perspective uh, either in terms of you know SSID uh, in terms of you know link speed uh, channel the way the channels uh, have been provided and so on now airtight also has a planner like an RF planning tool so one option is to either you know just import image files, but if you have actually used the planner tool to plan your Wi-Fi network, you can actually import the output of that planner tool with you know, all the building material settings as well as you know, the placement of devices so that it actually picks up obviously you know, live data that the APs are seeing and actually renders a more realistic uh, RF coverage. And quickly moving on to the report section, uh, and again, coming you know from a very- Sorry, sorry to stop you. Can you go back to the plan? Can you uh, do the planner design beforehand and use it to pull a bill of materials? Correct. Early yes. on. Can we see uh, one of those reports? Sorry? Can we see a report of what would come out of that? So the planner tool actually is a separate tool. It's not into oh, okay. built-in, but you can import those files here. Oh, okay, so. Yeah. yeah. Can you customize Sorry. the colors for your heat maps? Uh, not at this point. Well, say, say something. Because red is bad. Red is bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, this is the legend we are using, and again, depends on you know what coverage you are using. But sure. Uh, yeah, most of us have a have some sort of air magnet, like a how color scheme that we use. For right, right. So, so you can do that in the planning tool, but not not here. But and yeah, we also offer tool. planning as a service. So. You, not only as a tool, but also as a service. So you're my competitor. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can start planning your sites. <laughs> uh, so to quickly, you know, wrap up this session, uh, you know, just want to also give you a feel for, you know, a rich repository of predefined reports that come in the system, uh, both from a wireless performance monitoring perspective as well as, you know, wireless security in terms of, you know, vulnerability assessment, uh, in terms of, you know, all the different types of uh, vulnerabilities or threats that might be uh, <coughs> detected, or from a compliance perspective, you have you know all the regulatory or government you know compliance where things like PCI DSS 2.0, and the nice thing about this is that you can either generate the report on demand, right? When you're actually logged into the console, it supports in you know, XML, PDF, and HTML, or you know, and even when you do that, of course, the time period you can, you know, it's fully customizable. You can define it over weeks, days, months, and so on. Or instead of doing it on demand, you can actually schedule a particular report uh, and define, you know, how frequently or how you know regularly you want a report to be generated and either archived on the system or be actually emailed into your inbox. So um, there was a question, how do the APs talk to the NMS, is it? APs talk to the, the management? The, the management, yes. Yeah, yeah, so the management server and the AP, we have uh, a proprietary protocol, uh, which is you know, AES encrypted. <coughs> is it um, all of the APs talk, or does one do all the talking for them? No, so it is all the APs talk to the management server, uh, but you know, typically the actual traffic that you are looking at, you know, from the AP, since you are not really the the data plane and the control plane is more sitting at the AP, right? So it's only the management, uh, and typically it is of the order of you know 500 bits per second. How do you handle roaming? Do you do any support any of the fast roaming protocols? Oh yeah, uh, so we do have, have support for OKC uh, for layer two roaming. Yes. So if. The, oh. Can you, just ask, how do you do RRM between, how, how does the controller in the cloud change power settings and channels, or do the APs themselves negotiate that? 
currently so it is not done at the central point ap's will negotiate that so ap's talk to their neighbors to figure out what channels and plan correct and that's proprietary i'm assuming correct what eeps do you guys support sorry what eeps eep methods eep type oh eep type uh so it's one x i mean uh, it's authenticator so the eep type is between the radio server and a client we we are not kind of uh, we are invisible to that yeah transparent okay, so, to that so you guys don't have a radio server on no, the, not, no, not on the ap not today. Okay. yeah so if your control plane is at the ap and your ap's are sharing information with each other across their wired connection and your ap's are doing control plane uh, rm calculations for example on the ap um but what happens if you have a bunch of APs in a, in one location that are on different VLANs? Are they going to end up fighting with each other? How do how do they know they they belong to the same RF group, if you will? No, so RRM computations are mostly happening by sensing in the air. So for that, we are not exchanging any information. So the APs are sensing in the air. They are looking out what interference other APs, your own APs and channels, are there, and they are adjusting independently. For RRM, we are not exchanging any. Uh, information like you are suggesting. So, how do they know it's a neighboring AP? It, it's based on their visibility in the air, okay. because the interference is going to happen in air. So, what matters is what you are sensing in air, right? In terms of which APs are around. And well, not necessarily, right? Because if I have if I have my four APs in a room and somebody brings in a rogue AP, yeah. I don't care about that rogue AP, right? So, I want my RM calculations to take precedence and priority yes. over somebody else's rogue. Well, but if APs. that rogue AP is on channel six, right? Then none of these four APs in our case also will go on channel six. You have to care about that, right? Because it's still transmitting in the air. And it's taking a capacity in the air, so you doing RRM computation without cognizance of neighborhood or such intrusions is not going to work because they are there, they are in the air. You have to get away from them. Is there any over-the-air communication between them? Today, just based on the sensing, yeah. So RRM is a one-hop calculation for you. So they all just see the world from their own point of view. Correct. Correct. How do they know to lower their change their power setting? Power change setting dynam dynamically, we have seen in the deployments, uh, there are two schools of thoughts. Some people think that it's a very unstable system, and they set the power levels based on the planning and let it stay there, whereas some people go for dynamic power adjustment. We are mostly in the first school, where people want predictable you know, power assignments and coverage areas, and just use auto channel as a convenience factor, because you have no control over neighborhood APs and the rogue APs, and other hotspots coming into your environment, right? So you do auto channel, but you usually fix to the same power. That's how we plan okay. our customers' network. So no coverage hole mitigation or anything? Not today. Those. Not today. We don't do any dynamic stuff there. Then I'm assuming you don't have a mesh. Not today. It's coming in Q4, yeah. So he will announce some of those, yes. What about on the, the back side? You said you, you talked about they communicate over the, the, the VLAN on the wired network. Is that layer two only, or is there? It's layer two. Yeah, it's clear. No layer three communication. Not today, not today. <clears throat> Can we go back to the, the topic of roaming? Because you, know, you partially answered the question by saying you support OKC, but also roaming is not just you know how you handle your key management, but it's also what do you do for layer three roaming if we have all the APs on different VLANs, like you know Sam's point of having. <clears throat> right, right. So <clears throat> when it comes to layer three roaming, uh, you know you can look at it as you know. Two parts. One is, if you are thinking, when you say layer three roaming, if you are talking about seamless handoff, mm -hmm. then uh, we don't support that today. We do, though, exchange information between access points, like I think Hemant mentioned about, you know, st sticky smartphones, as we call them, where they actually do not give up their IP address and do not even, you know, let the AP know that they are renewing the IP address. So, those, some of those issues, or even, in, let's say, for a guest Wi-Fi network, if a user is moving from one AP to the other even across layer three, then the APs make sure that they actually, you know, uh, keep a state of, you know, the user actually you know, gone through the captive portal, gone through the authentication and so on. Do you, do you share um, any kind of firewall state as well, or is it just authentication information you're sharing? Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, so you, uh, <clears throat> I think you can have, you know, for guest users specifically, things like, you know, blackout time, uh, login timeout and so on uh, can be shared. Uh, Hemant, uh, so we, these are not seamless layer three handoffs. So the firewall state will be reinitiated on the second AP, okay. right? That's if that's what you are yep. asking about. So you're going to drop a session. Like
Yeah. Because it's not seamless layer 3. Yeah. But at layer 2 for voice over IP using OKC, that's seamless. It's a 50 millisecond. Because it's bridge, right, to the same VLAN. Yeah. Is there any provision for um, templated configurations by time of day, schedule, radios on, off, overnight in a given location? change SSIDs in a given place based on a schedule? Is there any of that sort of? Yes, it's a good question. So in fact, so the product that I have today doesn't have it, but the scheduled SSID is actually uh, coming in the Q4 release. 